we are surveying the uh, structure of the book of Genesis and uh, have noted then that uh, it begins with the creation prologue and for the rest then is divided into ten parts by a formula in the Hebrew Elatoma Do, so these are the generations of and uh, we discussed the fact that that <coughs> formula should be understood as a superscription for what follows, not as a colophon subscript for uh, and something that goes before. No, it's a heading for what follows, and that its uh, significance is that uh, the, the, it describes the, the ongoing history of uh, the person who is named. It does not describe the, uh, the, the origin uh, of that person, but it describes uh, uh, as I said, his ongoing history, whether in the simple form of a list of names of his descendants or a, a somewhat more ample account of the family history going on uh, from him. Now, it is true that in one or two cases, that right at the beginning of that ongoing history, the, a particular section might begin by just delving back and mentioning the, the origin of the person name, but that's not the force of, uh, of the heading. So these are the generations of uh, indicates uh, uh, here is uh, the, uh, the, the, the family history of the person named in, in uh, the form. All right, so uh, ten times then uh, that uh, expression appears, divides the book into those ten parts. And uh, now what we were trying to show is that there is structure. There, there is arrangement uh, uh, to the ten sections, and, and specifically it is arranged in two triads, followed then by two uh, pairs. And uh, we had uh, then traced, uh, you know, as fully as we want at this point, uh, to just by way of outlining the book, we had traced uh, the first uh, triad, and so now we have this first uh, the triad, and, and we were emphasizing the way in which, in terms of literary arrangement, uh, uh, we have the phenomenon of, uh, of uh, recapitulation, where the arrangement of the, the material is uh, uh, heavily thematic. And uh, so the period of history is traced here in the first and second uh, uh, Ela Toledot uh, sections of the book, the history is traced from uh, about the fall to the flood, a vast long period of history. And uh, so you come to the flood at the end of this first section, which extends from 2 4 to the end of chapter 4. By the end of chapter 4, you are on the verge of the flood, but you stop short in the narrative at that point, and then you backtrack uh, and go through the history again. And only after you've done that, then in the third <coughs> climactic section, you come to that great uh, act of, of divine judgment that terminates the world that then was, as we were noticing calls uh, in this period of time, the pre-Diluvian period, the world that then was, and then we'll move on. Uh, so it covers the history twice, and with the theme uh, determining that. So the theme here is that we line of from Adam to Noah uh, uh, through the line of Cain, and uh, then you know, the second time through we trace it from uh, Adam to Noah through the line of, of Seth. And Cain, of course, is the rejected line, and in association uh, with him, we therefore find ourselves uh, following the history of, of uh, the world and its uh, rebellious turning away from God and its uh, a perversion of the divine uh, gifts of family and, and, and state, and with the latter looming large as, as what's going on there. So we have this phenomenon of, of the state, the city of man, is the way that I'm describing that. And so that in our outline, that's what we saw fit to call this first section, the, the city of man in the old world, the, the world that then uh, was, and there's the story then of the escalation of evil in the, the city of man. We, we, we saw that, and there was the theme of uh, the lust for a name uh, that uh, occupies the efforts of uh, humanity in this line of pain as they are bent on exalting themselves against uh, the uh, throne and the uh, name of uh, God until you come to the uh, ultimate figure in this dynasty of, of Cain. Who is the founder of the, the first city there, the 
establishes his dynasty and uh, brings up the figure of Lamech, uh, and he discusses how he is, a, in terms of the pattern of history and the total eschatological pattern here, uh, he is or uh, represents sort of the Antichrist stage of uh, things. And we were pointing out, you know, the, the, the relevance of, of this ancient uh, uh, history for us today. It isn't just uh, some antiquarian interest in things that happen and have no relevance to us. No, it's uh, eschatologically very uh, relevant and urgent because of uh, the instruction of our Lord and uh, as was by Peter that here is indeed the eschatological shape of, of the history that is being replicated in, uh, in, in subsequent history leading down to the, the day of Christ or the, the days of Noah and the days of uh, the day of the Lord are, are made parable, uh, parallel to one another and so we, we see the shape of, uh, of, of uh, history under the full covenant of grace down to the, the end in this uh, in, in the, the history of this pre-diluvian period and so it reaches its Climax of New Testament history, will in that man of sin, of lawlessness, that antichrist uh, uh, figure, that that type of phenomenon that uh, that uh, the triggers the the parousia, the sense of our Lord's return and the judgment uh, and so forth. Well, we come to that point, and uh, as we said, then sort of moving right into the divine judgment it, itself, that that intrusion, of that the typological intrusion of what God will do at the end of the world. That's the thing that happens at the flood just before we get to that and we backtrack. And uh, here we have this theme, which is the be prominent, the dominant uh, theme, that God's purposes haven't failed in, in the, the development of this thing inspired by, by Satan. Uh, the, the, that doesn't uh, mean failure for God's original purposes as he's trying to establish this cosmos into a, a holy kingdom of, of his own with a, a, a people uh, for his glory. You know, that purpose is uh, still intact and in place. It, it is announced even in the midst of that first section, God's re redemptive uh, purposes uh, are announced in, right after the fall and the messianic uh, promise of the seed of the woman and so on. And uh, with that promise, which is uh, then embodied uh, up there in Genesis 3.15, we see in the course of, of uh, fulfillment here in, in this history of the line of Seth, the godly line. They were interested in their own thing. The line of Seth, as we are told toward the, the end of the, uh, this section, are, uh, well, I guess we were actually told that at the end of this section by way of transition at the end of chapter 4. This line of Seth was all already characterized those who call upon the name of the Lord. So that that covenantal relationship of God and people, whereby his name is, is uh, given to them, and they, 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 they confess it, and they own it, and they call upon God, uh, surnaming himself after him, and, and pleading with him to, to be a father unto them, to help them in their need. That is what characterizes this line, and so we speak of this uh, section, the theme of this section then, as the community of faith. Well, we get the city of man, there's the community of faith, the congregation of God's people, the altar congregation. Uh, and uh, the account of their history, the beginning and the end, and all through it, there stands the altar, the altar of, of priestly worship, the altar which is uh, vis-a-vis the world, uh, an altar of prophetic witness testifying uh, to the world. And so there is this, this the altar that, that bears their witness uh, to the world, that uh, this, is, this is the will of their God. In the midst of this history, there is not just the testimony of, of the altar, uh, but there's the testimony of the word that goes through prophetic figures, uh, like the figure of the Enoch at the beginning of the story, the figure of Noah at the end. Uh, there's a, a prophetic, there is a, a prophetic line that is uh, present in the midst of this set by community, bearing a testimony to the name of, of the Lord. And so the story once again then moves from Adam to Noah, and just this transitionally. Chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, the end of the first section ended with, with a pointer uh, down to the uh, Sethite community. So now uh, the, the end of this second section uh, picks up with Lamech, where that first section had broken off and brings us once again to that Ashley Christ climax uh, episode or, or period 
uh, which uh, brings on quickly uh, the flood, and so we uh, discussed the, the sons of the gods uh, and interpreted them in terms of uh, the city of man with its kings uh, becoming so perverse uh, that it uh, is uh, trampling upon the institution of the family, trampling upon the institution of the state itself, but worst of all, uh, blasphemously uh, training for itself the uh, deity. And so we have the phenomenon of divine kingship ideology present and, and functioning in, uh, uh, in the city of man. And that uh, is the, the, the ultimate that is the thing then that calls for quickly the, the, the judgment of God. So we move on then to the third section. And there, in fact, then we, we have God's judgment on the world that then was, your point out, is that which terminates uh, this old world water made out of the water and now uh, destroyed in the water. And Peter brings out the sort of the, the massive cosmic uh, uh, the total character of this uh, uh, period uh, by actually using the language of new heavens and new earth. As, uh, so the, the old heavens and earth pass away, the way Peter puts it, and it's virtually a new heavens and, and earth uh, that we get here. And, and so this episode is not just typologically anticipating the final judgment, but typologically also it is portraying the new creation of our heavens and earth. In connection with the uh, final consummating judgment of God. So here is uh, then an episode in, in which the final judgment uh, is intruded into history, the way God will deal with mankind at the end of history when no longer is he tolerating the wicked as he now does in terms of physical common grace. He will now close the door of common grace and of all kinds of grace. And he will proceed not to deal with mankind in terms of any kind of common blessings, but he, he will differentiate clearly the sheep from uh, the goat in, in final judgment and vindicate and bless uh, his own people with their eternal inheritance, but simultaneously he will obliterate and destroy and cast into hell and condemnation. So for not his people, but does not take place during the present church age. Uh, that takes place at the final judgment. but. Amazingly, at certain points within history, it also takes uh, place at uh, the flood uh, in connection with God's uh, use of his people Israel to bring final judgment upon the Egyptians and upon the Canaanites, so that there are typological anticipations of um, the nature and the principle of final judgment in history. And, and here is the most massive one that, 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 that scripture then records for us the final judgment of the world that then was, and it takes the form of a covenant, uh, because uh, final judgment is, it means salvation for God's people. It means destruction for the world, but final judgment is what God's people long for, because it brings to an end uh, the period in which they had to put up with the, the persecution of the world in, in all patient suffering, martyrdom, and, and so on. And, uh, Finally, in the Antichrist stage, when God and Magog gathers all of its forces together and besieges the beloved city, see, uh, this is uh, what final judgment means for God's people. It's to be delivered from Antichrist, who is God and Magog. And, and so it, it's a work of salvation that God is promising when he promises to Noah that he probably bring final salvation on the world, because in the midst of it all, he provides Christ as, as, as an ark. Uh, within which uh, his own people can make their way safely through the outpouring of God's wrath and emerge us from a tomb and a resurrection on, in the new world, the new heavens and earth that lies beyond. And so there is a, a covenant that God makes with uh, Noah, an ark covenant, a salvation covenant, uh, in, uh, by which Noah, building it, condemns the world and saves his uh, own own family, a sort of a Christ figure, as will be discussed when we come to that. And, uh, all right, so here we have the climax of the first triad in the form of uh, this covenant. All right, this is not the beginning of covenant, someone after the class of that's going to be uh, back here. We call the prologue the covenant of creation. Uh, fine, and of course, that covenant of creation arrangement. Uh, 
is uh, discussed further under the first section in uh, the, the way it all worked out in the, in the garden and the account of the fall and so on. So there's a covenant of creation operative uh, on a, <coughs> to the history recorded there. But then, of course, what in, in covenant theology we call the covenant of grace. It's the overarching uh, way of describing God's feelings from the fall to the consummation. That covenant of grace was, of course, initiated also at that point. I mentioned Genesis 3.15. Uh, that is recorded in the midst of that uh, first section already. And of course, that is a, a, an announcing of this new order that we call the covenant of grace, which is uh, in place. And uh, the history of Seth is a, 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 an account of the form that covenant life was taking under this covenant of grace uh, on earth and in, in, in the existence of this community of, of the faith calling on the name of the Lord, this covenantal uh, recognition of one another, uh, of God as God and Seth as, as, as his people. And so the covenant of grace, of course, has been going on all along and it will continue and it will eventually come to expression in the Abrahamic covenant and the Hermitic covenant and the new covenant and so on. And, uh, and here's another of those several subdivisions, sub-administrations of the overarching covenant of grace. Here is one of them. And uh, this particular one then has reference uh, to that one particular episode. Uh, by the end of that episode, which lasted about a year, this covenant then was uh, fulfilled. You and I are not functioning under that covenant with uh, Noah. Uh, well, we are under the, the basic covenant of grace, uh, which it was a part. Uh, and uh, but now that covenant had reference to that one particular episode, which the ark figured as the, the instrument of, of salvation for God's people. And uh, so that's the big thing in this third section. And uh, yet here too, we have the feature of transition to, to the next section, uh, indeed to the next, to the world that is beyond the flood the world that now is, the new heavens, the new earth beyond the flood, that, that is anticipated and prepared for still within this climactic third section. It's prepared for in the form of a second covenant. And then when we get to this in more detail later on, I will be emphasizing how utterly important it is to distinguish these two covenants that we are dealing with here, and not, as most people do, uh, to confuse them. It's uh, something that uh, it discourages me to see how in uh, the form writers dealing with the subject of the covenant, they just keep on confusing these two as if they were one and, and the same covenant. And the result of this is that you uh, have no solid basis then for any concept of common grace or any uh, really biblical way of distinguishing properly in uh, determining the function of person, state, and and, and so on. It's vitally important to recognize then that the covenant that is described in Genesis uh, 6 and 7 and, and 8 is uh, one covenant. It's the covenant that God makes with the covenant family, Noah and, and his family. And then there's a completely different covenant that, that he makes after the flood uh, <coughs> described from uh, Genesis 8, 20 on to Genesis 9, 17, uh, which is a covenant with all the earth not just with uh, his own people, but with everybody, and just with, with all the creation, with, with, with all the earth, this covenant. And it's not one uh, like this that provides for a coming of the kingdom, or the covenant of salvation provided for the coming of the kingdom. As we said, it's not the real one. It's, it's an anticipation of final judgment. And in the ark itself, there, there is a, the symbolism of the ark is fascinating. It's a, it's a, miniature cosmos, and the cosmos is conceived as uh, the temple of God, the kingdom of God, the temple of God. And, and so uh, in a symbol, in the ark, uh, Noah has here received the ultimate kingdom, uh, typologically. That's what the ark is, uh, a three-story universe, uh, a three-story ark, et cetera, et cetera. As I say, the details are fascinating, but that, that's the, uh, the, the essence of it that uh, the covenant with Noah and the ark has provided the kingdom of God. Now this covenant that is described basically in, in the beginning of chapter 9 
does not provide the kingdom of God. It just provides for the stability of the present world order, uh, which doesn't consummate in the kingdom of God, but terminates in final judgment. And uh, so saving grace consummates at the final judgment. The, the order of common grace terminates. It doesn't get beyond that. It doesn't lead you, you to heaven. All, all this covenant of common grace does, as I said, is seed time and harvest, summer and winter. There will be stability, not again a catastrophe on the order of the flood, and that, uh, whatever the extent of the flood, nothing that uh, uh, massive. Uh, again, uh, the social order will continue and, and so on, again with family reproduction, uh, uh, the state and so on. All of that is provided for in this subordinate uh, uh, second covenant that is described there in the middle of, uh, in the beginning of Genesis 9. So very important then. Uh, to see the distinction between these uh, two covenants. One, an arrangement of the Holy Kingdom, and the other, an arrangement for the non-holy common, that's what common in part means, non-holy, uh, just an arrangement for the non-holy order uh, of, of this world. Uh, all right, and then finally, within that third section, your outline, you will notice it speaks about the oracle, is it, of, uh, yeah, the kingdom oracle, where now Noah, looking to the future, proceeds as he pronounces a curse upon Ham Canaan and a blessing upon Jacob. <coughs> a blessing upon Jacob. Uh, he, he surveys prophetically uh, the whole world history uh, down to the horizon of the, the New Testament. An amazing, programmatic, uh, and comprehensive uh, uh, preview of uh, all of the rest of history uh, recorded. In, in scripture, uh, in, in including, of course, the developments that we're about to get in the Abrahamic covenant with its fulfillment in, in Israel and Israel's possessing the kingdom of God by way of dispossessing the Canaanites. Uh, uh, but beyond that, it, it is also pointing to the time when uh, the doors of the, the kingdom tent will be wide open and the Jacobites will come uh, pouring into the kingdom, the prophecy of the Gentiles uh, coming into the covenant in, in the New Testament age. So uh, here in Genesis 9, verses 24 to 27, the oracle of Noah, you have a little preview of uh, all of the rest of the biblical history in, in terms of the uh, distinctive roles uh, to be played by the descendants of Noah's three sons in uh, this uh, whole uh, ongoing history. Well, that's... Uh, uh, one huge picture of, of uh, all of history and religious reality all packed into this short compass. You can see what it's all about within a, a short, uh, short literary space. And it all now repeats itself in the second triad. The city of man theme repeats uh, as you read in Genesis 10, 10, 1 is, a, is a, the fourth you know, total, total heading. And uh, when you get in chapter 10, think back in your Bible there, you can call the table of nations, remember? Where it takes the three sons of Noah and, and spells out uh, their, their descendants uh, for you. And uh, how they are, are spread abroad in, in uh, the earth once again. Uh, just as in the beginning, they, they had uh, spread out and been dispersed. And so again, then they are being spread abroad and distinctions are developing among them ethnic distinctions, geographical, political, linguistic, uh, formula keeps appearing in Genesis 10 of, of the results of, of their dispersion and, and uh, varieties uh, in all these areas that developed. And, and so the, nation, the world is populated again uh, with uh, all of these peoples. It's just it's not the story of redemptive history, especially. It's just how uh, how things in terms of God's covenant of common grace are perceived. Mankind uh, isn't being wiped off the face of the earth again. He is being tolerated there. Uh, the, the family is functioning, the state is functioning, and all its variety is, is taking place. And so Genesis 10 is a picture of God's common grace in operation. The city of man is there again. And of course, <coughs> happily, uh, history is repeating itself in terms of, of 
the way in which man abuses uh, this good gift of uh, the state as all these nations are being developed here and there and, and you get indications of that uh, in Genesis 10 especially in a figure like uh, Nimrod who is called as we saw you uh, bore just like the, the, the Gibberim that were mentioned back here in the Antichrist stage of the world that then was and so things are going wrong but the flood has renewed the world but it has to renew the hearts of uh, everyone and, uh, and they are, are still uh, perverting corrupting the divine water so we have the theme then again of the city of man uh, now in uh, this present world and the inward direction the, the inward religious direction of, of, of the thing is uh, spelled out for us then in the uh, closing episode there, in chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, the Tower of Babel episode. So what the inner spirit of this urban state enterprise is, that is uh, uh, surveyed in, in uh, chapter 10, emerges in this sort of representative episode of the, the Tower of Babel. Uh, here, the spirit of apostasy uh, <coughs> comes to uh, for full expression, and in the, the, their, their attempt to exalt it. It's that theme of a name again, isn't it? Uh, let's build uh, this uh, uh, a tower on, on the heaven, this, this central tower uh, on the heaven, and, and let's be scattered abroad and, uh, so we can make a, a name for it. It's that same lust for a name. It's that same defiance <coughs> of God when we come to uh, study this. We'll be saying how uh, this is the attempt of mankind to recover what they have lost back in Eden, back in Eden, uh, at the beginning, there's the mountain of God. There, there is the holy mountain of God, the, the axis between heaven and earth, uh, the thing which later on uh, comes to be called uh, the, the Mount of Assembly, because uh, at the top of the mountain is, is, is the glory of God himself, as heaven comes down to earth on the top of the uh, mountain in Eden. And, uh, uh, the heavenly reality is God on his throne in the midst of all of the, his angels, the heavenly council that assemble there. And so the, the Mount of Assembly uh, represents uh, it, it's a, a motif uh, which uh, represents heaven projected down in visible form uh, to earth. And the biblical name for that could then uh, become to be in Hebrew Harmoes, the Mount of Assembly, which rendered it transliterated into the Greek becomes Armageddon. That's what Armageddon is. It's the Mount of Assembly. It's uh, the symbol for heaven is uh, itself. And uh, and that was there in Eden. And they're driven out of Eden and they've lost this the presence of God and his glory. Uh, they, they've lost this, this access whereby men can ascend from earth into heaven into the presence of God and into the realm of immortality. They lost that. They want it. They don't want to listen to the word of grace which is going to give it back to them in uh, the renewed mountain of God, which is uh, Zion. Uh, no, they reject that, and they are going to build for themselves on a church which they have made and so on by human effort. It works over against grace, uh, you see, in, in their lives. And so the Babel episode represents uh, the effort of human works to attain immortality and life and deity and everything else. Uh, you know, it's, it's, things are obviously going in the Antichrist direction again, and uh, that's what is described here. And it's out of faithfulness, it's out of faithfulness uh, to his promise that this present order would not again be uh, cut short, interrupted on the massive scale of the flood. It's out of, out of uh, his fidelity on God's part to that promise that he doesn't allow this escalation of sin that is taking place at the Tower of Babel to go on uh, <coughs> and so God disrupts that enterprise. <coughs> he slowed down the Antichrist development, you see, for a season, so that his purposes of redemption uh, can be fulfilled, so that Christ can come and work salvation, and so on. And so that's the way that ends, you see. That, that's the story of, of the city of uh, man. But uh, within it, now, there has been a, a genealogy, not only of the lines of uh, man and of Jacob, but also a genealogy of, of uh, Noah in the, the line of Shem up, up to a point. And uh, <coughs> that genealogy of, of Shem, which forms part of the story of the city of Ham, 
in Genesis 10 is then repeated here in the fifth section. And, uh, uh, well, we'll say it later, in, in, in the tenth chapter, the line of Shem is traced up to a, a particular point where it's going to divide between the line that goes to Abraham and the line that doesn't go to Abraham. And in Genesis 10, it follows the direction away from Abraham back into the world. But now in, in the skip section, when the genealogy of, of Shem is repeated, and you come to that point, it now gives you the descendants that are going to come down to Abraham. And, and so here we have the genealogy of Seth. Here we have the genealogy of Shem, Adam, to Noah, Noah to Abraham, to Terah, the father of uh, Abraham, and so here is covenant history in the midst of the, once again, same story. While everything's are going to the, in the direction of the Tower of Babel and Antichrist and the city of man in general, in the midst of it all, here are the saints of God, only that little remnant that came through the flood, now they are multiplying too in the midst of mankind. Here they are, and uh, so God's sovereign faithfulness to his basic covenant of grace is uh, operative. And uh, there is the community that uh, witnesses uh, to him. And uh, right, presently, then we are going to be taking these two steps. Take of that if we're trying to work out some absolute chronology for our state of the blood and the state of the creation and man and so on. <coughs> yeah, coming to that. But now then, meanwhile, just as this first triad ended in, the, in this covenant with uh, Noah, which was an administration of the fundamental covenant of grace. So now we come to the sixth section, which is the climax of the second triad, once again, to a covenant. And uh, in the third section, God gave the kingdom to Noah symbolically in the ark. In the sixth section, God gives the kingdom to Abraham in the promises. Abraham received the kingdom in the form of the promises of God to give him uh, the kingdom, and by faith then he, he, he has a uh, hold of it in, in the word of God. And uh, now, as I said, the covenant with Noah is something that transpired within that one year. You and I are not involved in, in, in that particular episode. The covenant of Abraham is not something that transpires in one year. The covenant of Abraham involves everything from that point on in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We are involved. We are the seed of Abraham uh, by faith in Christ. We are the seed, the true seed of uh, Abraham still in the New Testament. And so you can see then the, the, the far-reaching importance of this particular administration of the covenant of grace. Here is one which is foundational and definitive for all of the, the rest of the, the history of the covenant of grace. There will be other sub-administrations, but all of them uh, an outflowing and fulfillment of this covenant of grace uh, with, uh, with uh, Abraham. And in fact, the rest of the book of Genesis then also, as I, I suggested, can be thought of as, uh, as a as a continuation, really, of this sixth uh, section. It's uh, the, the covenant community on earth. And uh, uh, it will be important uh, for us to recognize as we go along uh, how the covenant is administered in history. And covenant and, and election are not uh, coextensive in terms of the uh, historical administration of the covenant of grace. Uh, this is why the Baptists are wrong and the Presbyterians are right. Uh, the, 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 the church, the, the covenant community, it cannot be identified in terms of of a election in, in, in history and in the administration of the covenant of grace. It is uh, so ordained by uh, the, the Lord and so works out that, that, that others and the elect find themselves within the, the, the covenant. Uh, they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Jacob is in the covenant, Esau is in the covenant, both circumcised, both <coughs> see the signs of the covenant. They're, they're both in the covenant, but not both the elect. So covenant in terms of historic administration, is a bigger circle. Election is a core element within the covenant. <coughs> covenant is a holy institution separated from the world, a holy institution 
Uh, all the members of which, however, are not in the uh, vote. I have a big story there. We'll have an ample opportunity to, to discuss it further and may possibly be the bastard brother or sister here that wants to argue with me about that later, later on. <laughs> Do we stop? Now? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, a, no, I'm a president. No, 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 I, I was okay. preaching a baptism last last Sunday. Um, do we sometimes also see, though, that the, as far as terminology, the covenant community also refers to as a historically elect, and then you have um, the true elect within that historical elect? Well, uh, what what you do have is uh, the, you have the, 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 the national election of Israel. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what you mean by the national election of Israel. And then you have individual election, okay? And uh, so in the case of the national election of Israel, uh, national election and covenant are coextensive there, okay? But in the case of individual election, as I'm in the situation of the church today, in the case of individual election, uh, the covenant community equals the church is not coextensive uh, with, uh, with the election. Uh, but uh, the reason I started to speak about this is that this all comes out within the rest of the book of Genesis. So the rest of the book of Genesis is all an account of the community of, of the covenant of faith. Outwardly, that's what it's all about. Everyone they, here is receiving, as we were just saying, the, the sign of membership in the, in, in the covenant, but they aren't all really in uh, in faith they are uh, not all in in Christ and so what we find is that uh, after these first two triads the climactic sixth, sixth one then em embraces a history involving two pairs and uh, the, and the, se the development is a, as it was uh, with the sort of the world community mentioned first and then the presence of God's people in the midst of it so here, the removal of Ishmael from the covenant community back into the city of man out there, that the world is mentioned first, uh, but, uh, and, and that is uh, uh, section, uh, there are seven at the bottom of your first page of uh, the outline, the dismissal from the covenant, the rejected line of Ishmael, back into the world, but sovereign grace of God in Christ is still operative, there is still within that covenant family, the true seed, the real seed of Abraham in the person of Isaac. And so the eighth section deals with Isaac. And then once again, that story repeats. Uh, Esau, circumcised, member of the covenant, but not really in Christ, not, not individually elect, and therefore dismissed back into the world with you. But meanwhile, there is Jacob, Israel the work of God, promise of God in Genesis 3.15, the eternal purpose of God is still making its way until then everything opens up in the book of Exodus and the rest of the Bible uh, and uh, the ongoing account of that remnant community in the world to whom at last Christ comes and that remnant community branches out and Noah's prophecy about Jacob is fulfilled and that Jacob has the Gentiles from flooding in uh, to uh, join the, 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 those of, of Israel who are, are, are true believers, and that's the story of uh, the rest of Scripture. And, uh, and, and so, as I was saying, by tracing the structure of the book of Genesis, the, the thing, the message, the, the truth that it's all about comes out very clearly. It's not just a bunch of little psychological, moralistic lessons about the faith, the trials of faith that this one has, but it isn't, obviously, is the fulfillment of the eschatological purposes of uh, God and how God was the one who was working all of this out. Now, in terms of literary style, what we have emphasized then is theme. Huh? So this isn't just a matter of plunging ahead chronologically. You deal with one theme over the same period again, climax. And here again, history of the city of man is traced from uh, Noah, to certainly down into the, the patriarchal period and so on, breaks off, comes back, and from the point of view, looking through another window on the same period, trace the same period of time, chronological recapitulation uh, in, in order to deal more effectively 
uh, with, with separate themes. And uh, so that is a feature of the style. Also a particular interest in certain numbers, 10 uh, overall sections of the book uh, with uh, triad number three of, of uh, particular interest, two triads as well as the two pairs. And as we said, uh, with the result of five plus five, five pre-Abrahamic stage uh, sections, uh, five Abrahamic sections. Uh, <coughs> writing technique, uh, interest in conventional uh, numbers and, and, and so on are part of the uh, picture that we want to keep in mind now as we move on to uh, some other specific stuff. I realize that uh, all along the line there are all kinds of questions. I was del deliberately trying to be provocative and, and to get you thinking about a lot of issues beforehand that will be coming up later on, but uh, clearly we don't have time then to be pursuing uh, them uh, right now. But since there was, was a hand earlier, I'd like to hear that. Yeah. And, and remember, my name was later to get to that. Uh, in the third division, there was, there was a, a judgment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Analogous judgment in Division 6? Uh, in, in prophetic anticipation, uh, there, it, it is uh, involved that the, uh, the destiny of the seed of Abraham is, of course, as uh, Noah's uh, oracle concerning Shem already brought out, the destiny of, of the Hebrew Semites, the Abraham Hebrew Semites, is to be the executive, the executive of God's wrath against the Canaanites, which is the, the, the type of, of judgment. And then, of course, ultimately, the <coughs> seed of Abraham is is Christ, who is the judge of, of the world and will uh, destroy the, the, the wicked as well as uh, deliver the right. So in, in prophetic promise and prospect, uh, uh, that judgment is uh, very much present in uh, the covenant of Abraham. I was wondering when we were talking about Noah and uh, the whole covenant there, if you were going to make mention of the sin of Ham and what that's all about. When we got to that, that's, uh, yeah. So, uh, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, if you accept the text as it is there, then there's no doubt of what it is. It's simply that he, he, he does uh, see his father and his drunken nakedness there in the tent and, and uh, proceeds to advertise the fact instead of uh, uh, doing what his brothers did, which was in love to cover over uh, sin. And, uh, and in modern discussions of, of the passage, which all involve manipulating the text or changing the text, it is sometimes thought then that there was a, uh, some uh, other type of sexual offense that took place between Ham and his uh, father mm -hmm. there that, that is supposed to be what is going on, or that, uh, that uh, the idea of his uh, looking upon the nakedness of his father is a way of describing taking his father's wife. And so there are various ways in, in which some type of sexual offense uh, beyond just the thing that is obvious. Uh, <coughs> but I, I think. In, there's no warrant for uh, changing the text uh, around in order to uh, provide a basis for any of those other interpretations. Okay, well, maybe we better can cut off questions uh, along this line uh, further. And uh, now, <clears throat> what I uh, told you was that as uh, we proceed here, what we're going to do before we get back into our fundamental analysis of the covenants, which we will do and when you turn your kingdom pro I can see it begins with an attempt to define covenants. We'll do that and then we'll discuss at length the, uh, what's involved in the covenant of creation, the covenant of God with Adam, the covenant of works of God with Adam, and then the, the subsequent covenants. We'll be doing that. That will be the thing that is uh, the, the gist of uh, the whole course from then on. But before we get to that, the problems uh, on the, the interface of the Bible and science, uh, especially the matters of the age of the earth and the age of men. Uh, we will occupy us here for a bit, along with the, the whole broader question of, of uh, the historicity of this. Now, you know, we have just assumed throughout this is genuine, real history, taken in at face value, and so we, we should, but uh, that is uh, not what uh, uh, lots of people want to do, especially when it comes uh, to about the first 11 chapters <coughs> of uh, uh, the book of Genesis, and so we want to evaluate that matter as well. But uh, we'll begin then with this question that comes up in the genealogies of chapter 5 and uh, in chapter 11. 
the second Toledo section and the fifth Toledo section. Uh, uh, let me just say that in, in, in what is our purpose, what are we up to in, 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 in dealing with these uh, issues, as uh, we all know they're heavily debated among us. And um, as, as I see what I'm trying to do here, I, I see myself as between a couple of extreme positions uh, that uh, I'm uh, trying to deal with on either side. And on the, the, the one side, I suppose it's to the right, although it's actually all wrong. Uh, uh, somewhere to the right is the literalistic uh, type of a approach to these issues represented, especially by the Institute for Creation Research and, and those uh, sympathetic uh, to it, uh, who, uh, who, who take the position that the, the Word of God demands uh, the view of a young earth and of, uh, of uh, man as a, a recent occupant uh, of uh, the earth. And I guess you're all generally familiar with that. And so uh, they not only for themselves uh, hold this view, which would be, be fine. I mean, they're, they have a right to be wrong. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but but I, I sure went uh, bring charges against them in, in, in the, the, the church uh, uh, for that era because it simply doesn't affect anything of, of uh, real essential value in terms of the doctrine of who God is, or the whole uh, principle of soteriology and, and the way of salvation. And uh, so I'm ready to tolerate them as good brothers and sisters in, in the Lord. But the problem is they're not uh, willing to tolerate others who, who don't uh, agree with them. And uh, so that, that is uh, really uh, uh, the rub in, in the situation. So I see that as something that has to be uh, answered and challenged and, and dealt with in the church, the, the attempt to make uh, a, a certain literalistic view on these issues, a test of orthodoxy. And that is, uh, if I let my rhetoric run away with me, I'd be ready to say that's a, a, a devilish uh, thing that's uh, going on, which is uh, disrupting the, uh, the, the purity, and not necessarily that the purity is wrong as a matter of uh, exegesis, but it certainly is, is destroying, disrupting the peace of the church unnecessarily. The peace of the church has to be disrupted when there's something at stake. What, Mach <coughs> what Machen fought for was something worthy of disrupting the peace of the church. Uh, what these brothers and sisters are doing is unnecessarily disrupting uh, the peace of the church and distracting us from the work of preaching the gospel and founding churches and, and doing the real work of uh, the Great uh, uh, Commission. And I think they all have a lot to answer before the Lord for, for what they, uh, they are, are doing, however well-intentioned uh, they may be. So that I see as on uh, the, the, the right wing that needs to be opposed. On, on the left wing, then of course, uh, uh, there are uh, among us uh, those who would uh, speak about Genesis 1 through 11 and uh, question its historicity, who would uh, speak about uh, the narrative there, not as the account of real individuals and real events in history, but in terms of the language of, of, of teaching model, that, that there were some sort of stories, parable type things that, uh, that can serve as teaching models of some kind of general spiritual truths, but uh, not uh, an actual record of historical events. And uh, that kind of thing is uh, found in uh, our ranks uh, all over the, the, the place, I suppose, in terms of, uh, of ourselves, the people uh, that might be present in this room or in connection with the life of this uh, seminary, uh, this, this is the big kind of problem that the, for, for us it emerged in connection with the developments in Calvin College and, 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 and seminary in, in uh, recent years. And uh, I've found myself in, in, in <coughs> somewhat in the middle of that and dealing with individuals uh, like uh, Howard Van Til and, and uh, John Steck and, and uh, young Davis Young and, and others there. Uh, who were inclined to uh, to uh, talk in terms of this uh, every man uh, teaching model and interpretation of what's going on here, which brings into basic doubt uh, 
the, the, the very historicity of the individual of Mad Adam. And uh, yet this type of view tolerated within the generally reformed community there on its uh, left left fringe, or fringe uh, that's uh, m maybe made too much uh, inroad toward the, the center of things as well. Uh, but that, that I see on, on my left uh, as another extreme that I am concerned uh, to oppose, that for those on my right I might seem like a, like a radical liberal, uh, to those on my left I seem uh, like a hopelessly uh, obsolete dinosaur conservative. And, uh, but that happens to be where the truth is there, right there <laughs> in, in, the, in the, the middle. And so uh, uh, in opposing that literalism, I don't want to be misunderstood as accepting uh, this uh, stuff to the left that would call in question the historicity of the Genesis narratives or that would adopt a view of the evolutionary origin of man. If I argue for a long ancient uh, old earth and, and, and uh, not for a recent uh, man, but for something that goes back and who knows uh, how far at the moment. But nevertheless, I am not doing this in the interest of, of uh, promoting a, a, a view of the evolution uh, of uh, man, uh, because I do not accept it for exegetical reasons uh, uh, that uh, man was uh, the result of a continuing living biological uh, uh, process as uh, it would be in view in the, the evolutionary uh, uh, theory. So uh, the, 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 this is the, the course I'm trying to steer is between uh, the, this thing on the right and, uh, and this other liberal business on, on uh, the left. And our, my objectives then, um, well, let's say uh, my objectives over against the, the side of the left then is is uh, to maintain uh, the authority and the coherence of, of uh, the scripture, which uh, I don't think is, uh, is uh, maintained by those on uh, the uh, left. Uh, my, my objective is, uh, is uh, to show that that teaching model, non-historical view of Genesis 1 through 11 uh, is not uh, warranted by the, the evidence. And uh, two, uh, as we might have opportunity to try to show the exegetical basis for opposing the idea uh, of an evolutionary origin of man. So that's my objective with respect to the left. And uh, what am I trying to do uh, with respect to my brothers and sisters here on the right who hold to this literalist kind of view? Well, I, all I would like to do is to plead with them to show them that there is warrant uh, for uh, alternative interpretations for other interpretations than the one that they are insisting on uh, by uh, by proper good and proper hermeneutical principles uh, to, to demonstrate uh, uh, that, that uh, the Bible, minimally, this is the way I would put it, minimally, I'm trying to show that the Bible warrants uh, are giving serious thought to other options than just that uh, literalist view. And actually, I, I, I want to do and, and, and think I do do uh, much more than that minimal thing. I also, I think, uh, have in mind exposing the the errors that are involved in, in that literalist uh, uh, position. And uh, that can show, I think, exegetically uh, that the, there are not only alternative interpretations, uh, but these alternatives, especially the, uh, the ones that I will be most favoring, are far preferable. Uh, 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 than, uh, than the literalist one. So uh, minimally, uh, that there are other interpretations than the literalist one beyond the minimal ob objective to show that, as a matter of fact, these other interpretations are better than, preferable than, uh, the, uh, those uh, of uh, the literalist. In fact, as I see it, I, I argue that you can't really believe in the consistency of Scripture and hold to a, a literal view. You have to give up your view of, of the coherence of the Bible. I'm, not on the defensive here, I take the offensive, that, uh, that it's only the, the views that I adopt that, that allow you to uh, uh, accept the, that scripture is harmonious in its teaching, the literalist view. Uh, you're, if you adopt those, you are not able to uh, uh, consistently to hold to the, the harmony and consistency uh, of, uh, of, of the scripture. So it's a purely exegetical thing I'm concerned with here. And it is purely exegetical. Uh, 
uh, evidence that I'm, I'm appealing to uh, for the views that I'll be taking of an older and a not so recent uh, man. And uh, mind you, then, it isn't necessary to, uh, for me to try to demonstrate the, the, the correctness of the scientific evidence uh, for an old earth or, or the, the, the correctness of the scientific interpretation of the fossil remains uh, of, of man. And as a matter of fact, I think there is a lot of evidence uh, that does support these views, but that's not where I'm coming from. And it's not necessary for me to demonstrate that. That will just be some other uh, evidence that one can add to the picture, but the decisive points I think that you and I should be concerned about as those who are servants of the word and, and teachers of the word, what is the biblical <coughs> evidence on this thing? And I think the biblical evidence is uh, very uh, decisive and it is uh, such that uh, should uh, prevent the, the ongoing uh, uh, disturbance that the, the literalists are bringing into our ecclesiastical circles by making this you, which actually it turns out to be wrong and a contradiction of the consistency of scripture, actually a test of orthodoxy. So uh, that, that's the mischief that we'll be up to uh, as we proceed. And after a break, we'll get started then on the subject of the, the antiquity of man, genealogy of Genesis 5 and 11. And, uh, you know, a part of the 11th uh, chapter. And what is uh, the bearing of this on the question then of uh, how long man has been around here on planet Earth? <laughs> and is it the case uh, that uh, the Bible here and the numbers that it connects with uh, the names of these various individuals provides us with uh, the, the data that we could uh, use to uh, calculate then, uh, an age uh, for the origin of Adam and, uh, and uh, so on or, or not? And of a uh, variety of views, be dealing with the three main ones that are around in circles where, where people are inclined to take uh, some seriousness the teaching of the Bible. Yes, please. I'm sorry, Governor. I was a little bit disordered in my thinking when you said that the genealogy is a good one. Yeah, in chapters 5. And then in Genesis 11, although as we just observed, the beginning of Genesis 11 there has uh, the Tower of Babel episode, so it's went around verse 10 and following in Genesis 11 that we have this second genealogy. Thanks. Now then, of the, of, of the three views, we'll call the first one the complete view, and the second one of the dynastic view, and then the, the third one will be the selective view. And uh, the complete view, as the uh, name uh, suggests, is the view uh, that we have in these two chapters, a, a complete, uh, unbroken uh, genealogy with uh, immediate father to son relationships uh, and being involved in, in each uh, successive uh, name. And um, so it, it is complete in, in that sense, uh, no, no genealogical breaks uh, in, involved. And so the language that uh, someone begat someone would be uh, true in the, the literal sense uh, of a, an immediate father-son relationship being involved. And also, of course, the, the, uh, there, there'd be the longevity attributed to these individuals. Uh, you know, many hundreds of years were that they lived, uh, so a thousand years, that, that also will be understood uh, literally. As a matter of fact, uh, the view I'll be advocating agrees on that second point too, that, that those numbers are, are literal. Uh, but on uh, that particular view, then you, you have uh, results, something on the following order. All, all, what would you do in order to make your mathematical computation? Uh, you would, uh, of course, take the small number that A was We got hungry and ate all my chocolate here tonight. <laughs> uh, a was uh, X numbers of years old, and he begets B, all right? And then B is, uh, uh, of course, after that, he lives uh, another number of years by whatever it is, and the total length of his uh, life is whatever, so there is. 
his total lifespan. And uh, now then, if you want to find out what the, the sum total is, of course, you add up these numbers. So you add up the small number, the age of the individual at its beginning, the next one, and if you add those all up, uh, you get, now here there's a little difference we have to note in uh, the Hebrew text and, and the Greek text that we call the Septuagint and some other uh, versions of the text. But in the Hebrew text, in, in our Hebrew text, the, the period from uh, the creation of man to the flood, uh, and, and by the way, to say from the creation of man to the flood uh, would virtually mean for these people because they would be the same ones who would be holding to the literal six days of, of uh, creation and so there would be only a week difference between the beginning of creation and the creation of man be sort of irrelevant to things. But in any case, from, from the creation of man uh, up to the, the flood would be something on the order of 1656 years about 1,656 years. And then from the creation uh, up to uh, Abraham, or at least up to the 70th year of uh, Terah, the father of Abraham, and then there's a, an exegetical question as to in, in just what year of Terah's life was Abraham born? Uh, and there's some little questions we could discuss about that, but if we, for the moment, we just speak about from creation up to the 70th year of Terah, the father of Abraham, virtually up to Abraham then, it would be just about another 300 years, only about 300 years then between Noah and Abraham, which turns out to be one of the huge problems with uh, this view, so that you would have um, uh, something uh, on the order of 1946 uh, years uh, there. Now, in connection, see, that involves the material in, in Genesis 11. <clears throat> And in Genesis 11, there is a, the problem of the presence or the absence of the name of Canaan, uh, which in some versions of the Bible would be spelled K-E-N-A-N, or in more recently it might be spelled C-A-I-N-A-N. And uh, now we'll be talking a little bit more about this, but uh, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, uh, where this genealogy is cited, we do have this additional name uh, not found in the Hebrew text, but which is found in uh, the Septuagint. And uh, so, uh, and 130 years uh, are attributed uh, uh, to this figure of, of Canaan before he begat the next one in line. So to the, the 1946 total that I gave you from creation to Abraham, if you include this additional name found in the Septuagint and in the Lucan uh, version of the thing, uh, and you would have a, to add up another 100. So you'd get something roundly about 2,000 uh, years from creation to Abraham. So for a round figure, that, that will do about 2,000 years. As I said, in, in the Greek version,